And at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, Thomas Statler. He is here tonight, and uh, he is a planetary scientist at NASA headquarters. He's a member of the NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office and a program scientist for the DART mission. And DART stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Uh, and DART is humanity's first attempt to change the motion of a natural celestial body in space. And it's the first full-scale test of an asteroid deflection technology. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Stadler. And again, thanks so much for being here tonight, Dr. Stadler. Thank you so much, Barbie. How's my sound? Sounds great. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And uh, thanks everybody for coming. Um, two weeks from tonight, our DART spacecraft is going to do something that no spacecraft has ever done. It's going to deliberately crash into an asteroid at a speed of about 15,000 miles per hour with the intent of moving that asteroid and changing its motion in space. The first time that humanity has deliberately attempted to change the motion of a natural celestial body. And we're doing this for the purpose of learning how to protect our planet from the natural hazard that's posed by near Earth asteroids. So if I can remember how to do everything in Adobe Connect, let's begin. Obviously I did something wrong. So uh, Barbie, I need a reminder on the basics of how to advance my slides. Okay, if you will uh, take your mouse into the bottom of the page, there's an arrow left and right. Yep, oh, just arrow it, huh? Okay, there if we go. Click and yeah. now that you've done that, you should be able to use your keyboard now as well. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, so the first thing to know about DART, it is the double asteroid redirection test. And it is a test. The Didymos asteroid, the asteroid that we're going to, is not a danger to Earth. And there's nothing that we can do to it that's going to make it into a danger to Earth. In fact, there's no known asteroid that poses an actual impact risk to Earth. The hazard is from the asteroids that we haven't yet discovered. And I'll, I'll show you in a while, we think that of all the asteroids that could possibly be worth defending ourselves against, we only know about 40% of them. Now, that's a huge improvement over, say, 20, 25 years ago, where we knew almost none of them. But we're still a long way to go to our goal of understanding where all of the potentially dangerous objects are. So we're doing this test now in order to develop an asteroid deflection capability in case we ever find ourselves in the situation that we actually need one. And that could happen. So let's go to this little animation. This is what we're doing. The DART spacecraft two weeks from tonight will crash into the moonlit asteroid Dimorphos. This animation is actually slow motion because we're coming in at 15,000 miles an hour. And so that last bit about what you just saw really happens in about the last second of the flight. But there we go. First, let's get oriented. I'm going to take advantage of a couple of videos that I made a few years ago. In fact, actually now almost a decade ago uh, to explain the situation, explain the basis of hazardous asteroids. So, uh, Barbie, if you could queue up that first one and uh, get the audio uh, connected, and hopefully we can see it. This is the, this Earth. Is the Earth, and this, this is, is, the, sun. is the, sun. the Sun. You'd have to, You'd line, have up to line up 109, 109 copies, copies of, the Earth. of the Earth. Just a second. Dr. Stadler, if you can mute your, phone, your uh, microphone while the video is playing, otherwise we're getting an echo. You bet, and you can start over again. That'll be great. This is the Earth, and this is the Sun. You'd have to line up 109 copies of the Earth to stretch across the diameter of the Sun, and 108 copies of the Sun to reach the location of the Earth. On this scale, Earth is too small to see. So we'll mark its location with a big blue dot and use a yellow dot to mark the sun. The stars are in the distant background. 
Earth is continually in motion, its path through space bent by the gravity of the sun into a near circle. That path is the orbit, and Earth takes one year to go once around it. Imagine a gigantic blackboard in space, and the Earth tracing out its own orbit. If we fly along with the Earth, we can see that, like a circle, the orbit is flat, and the blackboard marks the orbital plane. Actually, the orbit is an ellipse, but it's so nearly circular that it's hard to see the difference. At its closest point, Earth is only 3% nearer to the Sun than at its farthest point. But if we add the orbits of Mercury, Venus, and Mars, it's easier to see that the orbits are not quite circles, and that they are almost, but not quite, in the same plane. The orbits don't cross, so worlds don't collide. This is the Earth, and this is an asteroid. This is the largest asteroid, Ceres. Like the planets, Ceres orbits the Sun, but here, between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Most asteroids orbit the Sun in this region, making up the main asteroid belt. But main belt asteroids, including Ceres, never come close to the Earth, and so never present a hazard. This is the orbit of Sisyphus, which crosses the Earth's orbit. Sisyphus is actually the largest Earth-crossing asteroid, but that doesn't make it a hazard. Its orbit is inclined to the Earth's orbital plane, so the two paths never actually meet. It's only when the orbits intersect that an asteroid becomes a potential hazard. This is the orbit of Midas, a potentially hazardous asteroid. If Midas ever hits the Earth, the impact will happen here, where the orbits intersect, and only if Earth and Midas arrive at the intersection at the same time. We don't know what Midas looks like, but this is Geographos, about the same size. And this is downtown Washington, D.C. An object this large impacting anywhere on Earth would be globally catastrophic. Fortunately, Midas is only a potential hazard, not a current hazard, because even at their closest approach, the orbits are still several hundred thousand miles apart. On this scale, Earth is only this big. Remember, it takes more than a hundred Earths to cross the Sun, and more than a hundred suns to span the radius of Earth's orbit. That makes Earth less than one ten-thousandth the size of the near-Earth region. So to predict whether an asteroid is on a path that will take it here, here, or here, we have to know its orbit with a precision better than one one-hundredth of one percent. So that does tell you that it is a question of number, numbers, and to do planetary defense, we do need to understand the numbers. There are not very many big asteroids, lots more middle-sized asteroids, and zillions of small asteroids. And the smallest objects are not dangerous at all. Uh, let's see. There we go. So objects that are maybe, maybe only the size of a couple of people or the size of a cow um, are hitting the Earth frequently, about one per year. In fact, if you add up all of the interplanetary dust and gravel and things like that that falls on the, on the top of the atmosphere, it's about 100 tons of stuff per day. Yeah, 100 tons per day. But almost all of it is not dangerous at all. It just makes shooting stars, meteors in the sky. At the larger end, um, if you're concerned, if you're the kind of person that's concerned about um, Hmm, there we go. If you're kind of, kind of person is concerned about dinosaurs and uh, maybe eliminating dinosaurs or other friends, the kind of uh, asteroid that is really uh, a killer that would cause mass extinction, we know that only tends to happen roughly on a time scale of hundreds of millions of years. And we do live in a different time now because we have found the potentially hazardous large asteroids. If you had asked me 30 years ago, do we know 
whether we're at risk of being wiped out a week from next Tuesday by a giant killer asteroid coming out of the blue and destroying all life on Earth, I would have shrugged and said, no, we don't know. But now, in fact, we do know that we are not at danger, in danger of that happening because there aren't any giant uh, asteroids of that size that are actually on an orbit that would cause a collision with Earth. So I won't go through every piece of this slide, but you can see that larger uh, asteroid impacts on Earth are progressively less common. But in the middle of that pack, that scale of around 160 meters or so, that's about the scale that we really, you know, things like that and larger, we really do want to have the ability to defend against that hazard because an asteroid that large would produce damage on the Earth, on the surface of the Earth, large enough that it would affect everybody. If it hit a populated area, there would be regional devastation. If it didn't hit a populated area, well, there could still be secondary effects. So asteroids of that, of that size are things that could affect everyone in some way. And well, given the last three years, we all know that there are things that can come out of the blue that can one way or another affect everybody on the planet. As I said, the Earth is always being hit. It's a natural thing. You know, there is stuff in the solar system orbiting among the planets and running into planets. And this happens all the time. This map shows uh, fireballs, large fireballs produced by meteors uh, reported by US government uh, defense sensors uh, for uh, since 1988. And you can see there have been many such things. The one that's marked with the big red dot, the largest one uh, in the time we've been taking that data was uh, the asteroid impact over Chelyabinsk in 2013. I hope some of you remember that. Uh, I'll play another video in a second and maybe you'll, uh, you'll remember having seen the videos. This is the largest asteroid impact in recent memory. So, uh, Barbie, if we can go to that next video. It's December 2011, and a nondescript house-sized rock orbiting the sun has begun its year-long fall back into the inner solar system just as it has done thousands, if not millions, of times before. Its orbit crosses and actually intersects the orbit of the Earth. But the rock has passed through this intersection point thousands of times without incident, each time simply because the Earth was somewhere else in its own path around the Sun. On New Year's Eve 2012, it swings past the Sun for the last time. A month and a half later, on February 15, 2013, it slams into the Earth's atmosphere at a speed of 12 miles per second and explodes. The explosion could have leveled a city had it occurred at lower altitude. As it was, the shockwave shattered windows and injured hundreds. The Chelyabinsk event was the largest and most destructive asteroid impact in more than 100 years. This animation of the approach of the impactor is a reconstruction after the fact. We had no knowledge of the existence of this asteroid and no warning of the event until the impact actually occurred. Why? Follow the approach again. This time, we'll track along with the Earth, looking from the night side toward the sun into the daytime sky. In late 2012, the asteroid's orbit brought it inside the orbit of the Earth, swinging closer to the sun. In its final approach, it seemed to dive straight from the direction of the sun, lost in the glare, completely undetectable. An asteroid can be seen only because it is lit up by the sun. Even with a telescope, it appears as nothing more than a point of light. How far away that point can be detected depends on how we see it lit. Let's imagine putting ourselves close to the asteroid. With the sun behind us, we see the object fully illuminated, as bright as it ever gets. If we move to the side, with the sun off to the right, we see, at most, only half of the object lit up. And if we look inward, toward the sun, 
almost all of the object is in shadow, and we see hardly any light at all. So how far away could the Chelyabinsk impactor have been seen by the asteroid search telescopes in operation at the time? About 10 million miles, if they were looking away from the Sun. At right angles to the Sun, about half as far, in either direction. There is a region surrounding the Earth, inside of which the object might have been seen had the telescopes been pointing in the right direction at the right time. But this region is small compared to the orbit. And if we follow the motion for the last eight months before the impact, we can see that the impactor, approaching at the top of the screen, never came close to that region in which it could possibly have been detected. As it came interior to the Earth's orbit, only the shadowed face was visible. There was no opportunity to see it before the impact occurred. But what about earlier? Let's go back in time and see where Earth and the impactor were in previous years. Through 2012 and 2011, the asteroid was far from the Earth, out beyond the orbit of Mars in the most distant and slowest part of its orbit. It swung past the Sun in 2010, but Earth was not nearby. It spent 2009 again in the distant part of its orbit. As it accelerated and came inside the Earth's orbit in 2008, Earth was on the opposite side of the Sun. This is a typical situation for small hazardous asteroids. Years can go by between opportunities for detection or close observation, simply because the orbits of the Earth and the asteroid don't bring them into close proximity. We don't know the orbit of the Chelyabinsk impactor precisely, so projecting back in time is difficult. A close passage may have occurred in February 2004, but outside the zone of discoverability. The best opportunity before that was in 1995, but Earth was farther from the point of intersection. And in 1986, Earth was even farther away. Bigger asteroids Bigger can be seen can be at greater distances there. and have larger zones, larger zones of discovery. Dis Thanks. So you can see it's a challenging business, uh, planetary defense. And it's more than just trying to hit an asteroid. We do need to know what's there because, of course, we can't do anything about a dangerous asteroid if we don't know that it exists. So the activities that encompass planetary defense, what we're doing at NASA, are very diverse. A lot of, uh, a lot of our efforts are coordinated uh, through the International Astronomical Units Minor, excuse me, the International Astronomical Union's Minor Planet Center, which is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It is completely funded by NASA, but uh, feeds data to the entire world completely free of charge. That um, Minor, Planet Center, Minor Planet Center ingests the data from observers worldwide, or particular the uh, telescopes in uh, NASA's planetary defense observation system. We search and detect and track these asteroids, calculate their orbits. We use other telescopes to characterize them, to learn about them. How big are they? What are their, uh, uh, what are their compositions? Um, how are they rotating? That kind of critical information. We plan and coordinate uh, across the government and with international organizations. And we are also doing studies to mitigate uh, the danger of near-Earth asteroids. That includes, obviously, the DART mission. And we also assess all of our knowledge and all of the effects of our studies uh, in conjunction with our Center for Near-Earth Object Studies at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. The Planetary Defense Coordination Office, yes, it's a real thing with that great name, was established at NASA in, in January 2016, and our mission statement is to lead, in, lead national and international efforts to detect any potential for significant impact of planet Earth by natural objects, to appraise the range of potential effects by any possible impact, and to develop strategies to mitigate impact effects 
on human welfare. And those strategies to mitigate the impact effects, that's why we're doing the DART mission, to learn how to deflect asteroids and keep our planet safe. So this is what we're doing with the DART mission. We launched the spacecraft on November 24th next year, and uh, on September 26th, two weeks from tonight, the spacecraft will collide with the small asteroid Dimorphos, which is about 160 meters across and is orbiting the larger asteroid Didymos. Now that's a binary asteroid, a double asteroid, and there are lots of double asteroids, in fact, where one asteroid is orbiting around another. And we chose this asteroid because it is a perfect natural laboratory for this kind of a test. Remember, it is a test and a real situation, if we ever have to defend the Earth against actual hazardous asteroids, may not involve a binary asteroid, asteroid like this. For the test, somebody's got an open mic. Thank you. Um, one of my favorite things about the DART mission is I think somebody's got an open mic. You can mute, please. Thank you. Um, the name, double asteroid redirection test. I love this name because the word double has a double meaning. It's a double asteroid that we're going to, but it's also a double test. DART is two tests in one. The first test is the test of our ability, of our technological ability to build a spacecraft that will navigate itself and execute a kinetic impact on a small asteroid. But the second test, and maybe even the more important test, is how does a real asteroid respond to that impact? Because sure, we can take a few hundred million dollars worth of spacecraft and smash it to bits, but the real question is, did we move the asteroid? And how efficiently did we move the asteroid? And can we use that as a tool in the future if we ever need to? So a big part of DART is beyond just the impact itself, is understanding what we have actually done. An important thing about DART is that it goes beyond just uh, simple physics that you might teach in your classroom about conservation of momentum and one thing bumping into another. This is a hypervelocity impact. The spacecraft is hitting the asteroid at a little over six kilometers per second or 15,000 miles an hour, which means that in addition to delivering the momentum of the spacecraft to the asteroid, it's also doing a lot of work on the surface of the asteroid. It's digging a hole, it's excavating a crater and blowing out material back along its own path. And that's characterized by this momentum transfer factor that everybody in planetary defense talks about. For instance, if we weren't excavating anything at all, the spacecraft would bump into the asteroid and give it a push and that would be that. But if we eject, if we excavate a crater and blast out some material, that's like an instantaneous little rocket engine installed at the point of impact. And if we get even more ejecta out, that's an even bigger push. So the push by the excavated ejecta can equal or even exceed the push de directly delivered by the spacecraft. And that's one of the numbers, key number that we want to measure uh, as a result of this test. Here's a few pictures that just give you an idea of scale of what we're doing. Uh, Didymos, the larger asteroid, is about the size of the largest buildings on Earth. Dimorphos, the smaller asteroid, is about the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Uh, I like to think of it in terms of the National Mall in Washington, D.C., since that's close to where I live. Uh, you could fit the pair, Didymos and Dimorphos, uh, between the Washington Monument and the Capitol Building, um, uh, if you tried, with a little bit of room to spare. And if you know that big fountain out in front of the Capitol with the statue of General Grant in front of it, Dimorphos would just fit in that fountain if you turned it to the side, uh, about, about 90 degrees, it would just about fit. Or if you know the Air and Space Museum, Dimorphos is kind of about the size of the Air and Space Museum. Now, here's the essence of what we're doing. And let's see if this movie will run. No. Can we make, oh, sorry, I took this movie out, my mistake. So um, 
So Dimorphos is orbiting around Didymos, and you can see the white line that's labeled original orbit. The DART spacecraft is going to approach at high speed, impact the asteroid, and shift it to a new orbit that is smaller, tighter, and takes less time to go around. We've been observing this asteroid system from the Earth for years, and I'll show you that in a minute. And we know that that orbit for years, centuries, millennia, has been uh, completing one path around in 11 hours and 55 minutes, like the tick of a clock. But with the DART spacecraft, we're going to damage the clock. We're going to change it a little bit and make it run a little bit fast. We might not notice it uh, right away, just like if you damaged your watch and it started running a little bit fast, you might not notice it the next day, but maybe if three weeks later, you're going to notice that it's not keeping accurate time anymore. And that's how we're going to measure how effectively we moved, we delivered momentum to the asteroid. Also, uh, uh, carried, carried along on the DART spacecraft is a small little subsatellite, a CubeSat called Lichia Cube that is uh, contributed by the Italian Space Agency. And its job is to separate from uh, the DART spacecraft, offset to the side, offset behind, and follow DART in about three minutes behind and 55 kilometers off to one side and watch what happens. Not that we'll be able to see necessarily the flash when DART impacts, but we will be able to see the ejecta being blasted out of the crater which will be very important for our analysis. And we'll also be able to see the backside of Dimorphos, which, which uh, uh, DART never gets to see because it runs into the front side and there's no spacecraft left after that. Now this is a movie. Are we able to run this one? Well, if we can't run the movie, I'll start talking about it anyway. So one of the reasons that we chose this asteroid system is that our view from Earth is in the equatorial plane of the main asteroid and its moon. So that from our point of view, Dimorphos keeps going in front of Didymos and behind, in front and behind every orbit around. Now from the Earth, even with a large telescope, we can't see the two asteroids separately. All we're able to see is the combined light of the two. But when one asteroid goes behind the other, that's a little bit less light. And when one, or one asteroid blocks the light of the one that's going in front of or casts a shadow on it, that's also a little less light. So if you look down at the bottom, that's a plot. It's a graph of the brightness of the combined two asteroids versus time, uh, showing that every time around the orbit, we see a little dip. And the way we measure this is by taking pictures of the asteroid pair. It's just a dot in the telescope, but we measure the brightness over and over and over and over and over again. And we see that in time, we see these little dips, little dips, little dips. So if we're able to run this uh, video, that'll be great. If we're not, that's okay. Um, and so after uh, we impact Dimorphos with the DART spacecraft, the timing of those dips is going to change. And so the expected time of uh, the expected time of those uh, dips, those eclipses, is going to change. Oh, here we go. I'm sorry, my internet totally dropped out and it kicked me off. Here's the totally understand. So here we go. So before Dart. This is what we've been observing for years and years and years. There's a little dip in the brightness of the combined light of the two asteroids every time Dermophos goes behind Didymos and every time it comes around in front of Didymos. But with DART, we're going to impact Dimorphos, change its orbit just a fraction of a percent so that it's a little bit closer in to Didymos, going a little bit faster and completing its orbit a little bit sooner. So that one day afterwards, the difference will be barely detectable. And we'll be watching uh, in the days following the impact with telescopes around the world. But the day afterwards, there won't be much of a difference at all. And it'll be very difficult to see. 
we'll have to wait a little while, maybe two or three or four weeks, not sure. But if we wait long enough, it'll be like that watch that got damaged and starts running fast. Eventually, we're going to notice, here we go, several weeks later, that where the asteroid would have been without the impact, that's the white asteroid coming out from behind, is not the same place as where the asteroid actually is as a result of being hit by the DART spacecraft. That's the asteroid in orange. It's not where it would have been. And those eclipses, those ticks of the clock are not happening at the same rate. That's why a binary asteroid is the perfect natural laboratory for this experiment on how a real asteroid responds to a kinetic impact. If we can go back to the, there we go, perfect. So we have a network of telescopes worldwide that will be observing uh, for the weeks after the DART impact. So we'll be sure to uh, detect that change in the orbital period, we'll be sure to measure it. And the longer we wait, the more precise that measurement of the period change is going to be. And so the more precise our understanding of how much momentum we actually delivered to the asteroid uh, will get. Now let's talk about our great spacecraft because we only get to have this spacecraft for two more weeks and then it's gone. Here's the DART spacecraft. It's a box in the middle. It's got two big long solar arrays. I'm not going to talk about everything that's labeled on this diagram, but I'll just point out a few things. The most prominent things, of course, are these big rollout solar arrays. But down at the bottom, the thing that says Draco, that's a little diagram of our telescopic imager. The spacecraft only has one instrument on it. It's Draco. It's the camera. It tells us where we're going. It allows the smart nav, autonomous navigation system to guide the spacecraft to the, to the impact. And the images from Draco are going to be live streamed in real time about one per second during terminal approach. And that is how we will understand what we hit, where we hit, and what are the conditions on the asteroid at the place where the impact occurs. That's also extremely important for the analysis. Uh, and also, uh, just around behind, I'm not sure whether you can see my cursor, but it's not that important, where it's labeled RLSA, radial line slot array, back behind there's that little circular disk. That's our high gain antenna. That's how we send the images back to Earth, that's how we communicate with the spacecraft. And you'll see that again coming soon. Also on the side of the spacecraft is the little canister that's holding Leachia Cube, the Italian CubeSat. The Italian CubeSat uh, is carrying two cameras called Leia and Luke. I have no idea how they came up with those names. But Leachia Cube is deployed. Actually, for the last five years, we've been saying Leachia Cube will be deployed just before uh, DART arrives at Didymos. And in fact, Leachia Cube was deployed last night successfully. And while I've been giving this talk, I've also got on my second monitor, I've got my email up because I'm getting uh, updates on the status of Leachia Cube from the Italian Space Agency every once in a while. So Leachia Cube is deployed and it's doing well, which is terrific news. Watch NASA.gov for more news about uh, Leachia Cube and DART this week. Now, let's take a look at our spacecraft and have some glamour shots because uh, everybody uh, loves pictures of hardware. I know I do. And it really is important to, to, to look back and see how this mission was conducted. Because back in May 2020, uh, the construction of the spacecraft was just starting. And everybody remembers what we were doing in May 2020. We were getting used to the idea of a worldwide pandemic and trying to do everything remotely. And the fact that this mission has been carried out and the spacecraft was built and launched and has been operated during the pandemic is really a tribute to this fantastic team of hundreds of people who have been involved in the project. In fact, what was going on just before this, if you remember that really unpleasant, scary and unhappy time, the first a uh, major breakout of COVID-19 in the U.S. was in uh, Bellevue, Washington, suburb of Seattle. And at that time, that grayish, uh, tan, green, tan structure, the core structure of the spacecraft had just been fabricated and it was in Bellevue, Washington. And we couldn't get it to Laurel, Maryland, where the Applied Physics Laboratory is to start construction. We had a delay right from the start because we could not transport the core structure of the spacecraft across country 
for a few weeks. Um, but we did, and uh, then the construction, the assembly started, and uh, we the DART spacecraft grew uh, bit by bit. So here's that round thing I was telling you about. This is the radio line slaughter a high gain antenna. It doesn't look like your standard parabolic dish antenna at all, does it? Does it? It looks more like a pan for an extra large pizza, but it is a very innovative antenna. And I wanted to show you this on the ground because you'll see it again in a different context in uh, in a little bit. You can see the course, the basic structure of the DART spacecraft is pretty simple. It's a box and it's about the size of a person. Here we are with this basic spacecraft assembled. The uh, thermal insulation uh, blankets are on it. That's the reflective gold colored stuff. It's being raised into the vacuum chamber chamber for thermal testing uh, a year ago, June, uh, January, excuse me. Here is one of our solar arrays uh, rolled in, in the partially rolled out configuration being tested at, uh, the, la at the factory where it's being manufactured. And uh, here it is all rolled up about to be attached to the side of the spacecraft. This is our imager, Draco, before it was installed on the spacecraft. And it's going to be installed underneath from where you're looking at it, uh, Dart, the DART spacecraft is in the background. And so after being installed, this is the view from underneath looking up, uh, looking into the telescope. Uh, that's the imager that is guiding us to the kinetic impact. Here's Leachy Cube as it arrived at APL in uh, last August and just after it was installed on the spacecraft in September. And there is a couple of our friends from the Italian Space Agency very proud to have finally gotten their CubeSat attached to the side of DART. Um, the uh, spacecraft was fully assembled. You can see the solar arrays now installed, Leech Cube now installed in front. The uh, uh, interesting antenna is around the backside. Uh, just before shipping, it was put into a great big box, loaded onto a truck, and driven across the country from Maryland to California um, to be uh, integrated in the SpaceX facility. Uh, DART was launched on a uh, Falcon 9 uh, rocket, uh, courtesy of SpaceX. There's our rocket. Uh, that's me in the blue shirt. So this was, uh, I think it was the day before launch when in the integration facility at SpaceX. Um, the spacecraft was loaded into that fairing. You can see it's a small spacecraft compared to what would actually fit in that fairing. Um, uh, hauled out to the launch pad, uh, tilted upright, and on uh, 20... Fourth, well, 23rd in California time, 24th early in the morning, we had a beautiful launch. I was very, very happy to be there. Uh, the launch happened at the first moment of the opening of the launch window, and it was absolutely spectacular. Um, there is uh, uh, a little bit after launch, of course, we had the tremendous moment when the spacecraft was deployed. And this is the view from inside the launch vehicle. So the fairing, uh, has jettisoned and now you're looking up from the inside of the rocket that's the dart spacecraft that's our radial slot line array antenna uh, on the side and if we run the video we'll see the actual deployment of dart the job space. of falcon 9 was to get dart on its way to the dynamo system at this point we gotten enough velocity enough speed to send dart off towards the dynamo system and right now, well, we're in range of the ground station, so we can get all the data from, and so we can make sure we can actually capture the Start separation. separation confirmed. And we just heard the call out for spacecraft separation. You can see the video of the DART spacecraft on its way, heading on its way to the Digimo system. What a spectacular view of DART. Yep. Uh, just floating away from the Falcon 9 second stage. And that was quite a moment to see. And, and for, the, uh, for the team members on the engineering side who really built the spacecraft, that was quite an emotional moment for, uh, for everybody to see their hardware actually in space. It was really tremendous. So um, what have we done since then? Uh, if we can run this video, that'll show our trajectory. So there we go. So. Um, Earth is going around in its orbit. Didymos, when we launched, was quite a bit further away from Earth. We launched DART on November 24th of last year. And since then, it's been on an orbit that's kept it fairly close to the Earth. But the point, of course, is to meet up with Didymos at the time when Didymos is close to Earth 
to get in the way and basically have Didymos uh, rear end the spacecraft um, on September 26th. This was all intentional to have this happen at a time when Didymos was close to Earth and it was easily observable. Uh, we don't have to run the video again. We can just go on. Thanks. So we've been in space and the Draco imager is working. We have in fact seen Didymos. These are images from the DART spacecraft uh, showing our destination Didymos there. It's just a tiny little dot. This was now a couple of months ago. Uh, and it's going to be just a tiny little dot until very close before impact. Uh, the, on the next, uh, next uh, slide, there will be a video and we might as well just start that next video. This is something very similar to what you will see on the NASA TV broadcast uh, two weeks from tonight. This is showing on the left side uh, what uh, DART is going to see. The, um, the, uh, uh, the, the green crosses uh, are showing Didymos on the left, Dimorphos on the right. You can barely see Dimorphos underneath the green cross because it's just one pixel. The red circle is where the spacecraft is aiming, and the blue cross is where it would go if we didn't do anything at all. But we're doing a lot. The spacecraft is on its own maneuvering. You can see the thruster firings in the upper left. This is all running 30 times real time, but you'll see on the clock, the time to impact is only a half an hour. And this is really what we're going to see. We will see almost nothing, just a dot in the sky, even from the spacecraft until the last hour before impact. And we will see very little of Dimorphos, our actual target, until the last half hour. It's really only in the last half hour when we will begin to see what this target looks like. And all of this planning and all of the mission design and all of the software development has happened in a situation where we don't know what the thing we're going to hit actually looks like. It's a hard problem. Now, as we get closer in the last few minutes, we're, we're, uh, the expectation is that there will be fewer maneuvers, as you'll see. Uh, if you look closely, you can see the blue cross is now inside the red circle. So as we get closer and closer, we have to do fewer and fewer, or the spacecraft itself will have to do fewer and fewer corrections. Now, only seven minutes out, we finally begin to see what our target Dimorphos actually looks like. And two and a half minutes out, we go, we stop maneuvering because that's all we can do. And this is what things will, what things will look like uh, two weeks from tonight uh, as this, the images stream down once per second. This is still running five times real time, but uh, it's going to be a bit of a nail biter. And I think everybody's going to be glued to their screens, uh, watching Dimorphos getting bigger and bigger and asking and, and trying to understand what is this asteroid um, before we run out of time to see it. Once that impact happens and we lose the signal from the spacecraft, yes, a big cheer will go up. But I know I'm going to be thinking, and the rest of the scientists on the team are going to be thinking, yes, but the cool part is just starting now. Because after we lose the signal from the spacecraft, that's when the crater excavation starts. That's when the ejecta happens. That's when the actual process of moving the asteroid is happening in real time. And then in the days and weeks following that, that's when we will actually learn what really happened at Dimorphos. Um, yeah, that's the team, or no, that's part of the team. That's a small segment of the team, just to show that um, no space mission happens without a huge team. And this is just a tiny segment of the number of people who have been involved in DART. And in particular, planetary defense is an international issue. And, and the DART spacecraft is one of a pair of missions that exists within a broader collaboration called AIDA. If you were on a little bit early, you heard that in the, in the lead-in video. Because in 2026, the European Space Agency will have a spacecraft called HERA that will also arrive at Didymos, go into orbit, rendezvous with, the, with, the, with this asteroid system, and do a detailed study and characterize every single part of it so we will know in detail exactly what it was that we impacted with the DART spacecraft and exactly what happened to it 
as a result. Now, for, uh, for all of you guys who are educators and for all of your students, there is a wealth of information at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab website. So if you go to dart.jhuapl.edu outreach, there are lots and lots of different resources and activities. There is a toy bricks model. We all know what the name of toy bricks are, but we have to call them toy bricks. You can host a watch party for Kinetic Impact Night. Um, you can uh, take a little test, take a tiny little reading comprehension test and become a certified planetary defender along with the rest of us. Um, if you want to know, I'm not going to talk about this now, if you want to know if you have an observatory at your school uh, and uh, or your backyard and a good telescope, uh, you might be able to take some images of Didymos. It'll just be a dot. You won't be able to see much else. And sadly, you won't be able to see it with your eye and an eyepiece and a backyard telescope. But if you have a good camera, you might be able to do it. Um, I think that was another little video, but I don't think we really Oh, here it is. Uh, a little video reminding you of what we're going to do uh, two weeks from now. It's kind of amazing to uh, realize that it's going to happen after all these years of planning, uh, but it's going to be great. Um, September 26th, 714 Eastern Time. The broadcast starts at 6 in the evening Eastern Time. Uh, join us there um, and watch uh, NASA.gov for news on the DART mission.